Alrighty, welcome everyone. Thanks again for joining us today for the webinar, Charting a New Course for QCE Chemistry. Before we begin, um, we acknowledge the traditional own custodian, uh, the, we acknowledge the traditional custodians of the many lands on which we create and share our learning resources. We acknowledge the traditional custodians as the original storytellers, teachers and students of the land we call Australia. We pay our respects to elders past and present, and we also extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples joining us today. So just an overview of today's workshop, we'll start with a summary of key changes to the syllabus. We'll then look at um, IA2 in more detail, including modifying experiments and understanding the new ISMG. We'll introduce you to the new um, edition of Chemistry for Queensland, and then we'll have some time for questions. To take us through the first parts of the webinar, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Marriott McHale. Uh, Marriott is a QCE IB chemistry teacher at Churchy and also an author for the new series. So with that, over to you, Marriott. Thanks, Alina. Thank you so much. Um, welcome, everyone. I can't see you, but uh, I know there's plenty of you there. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon. I hope that you guys find this session really uh, informative, not just about the changes of the new syllabus, but um, also about the exciting things that are coming ahead for the new texts that hopefully you'll find really helpful for yourselves as teachers and also for your students. So um, as Alina said, this first session is really just to introduce to you the uh, major changes that are occurring in the 2025 syllabus. And um, some of you may have already been aware of it uh, through the QCAA webinars that have come through the last few weeks. Uh, and so just to recap, uh, for those of you who have uh, attended those sessions, for those of you who haven't, um, the changes that are uh, going through into the 2025 syllabus really come down to three major sections that have been changed. Um, the first of which is uh, to do with the list of cognitive verbs. And this is really to ensure that there's a seamless transition from firstly the Australian curriculum in the junior sciences years, but also within the sciences themselves. So uh, I'm sure of you, I'm, I'm sure some of you would have had uh, a few issues with some of the cognitive verbs that we are currently using, such as appreciate or recognize, they're a bit problematic in um, what is it really that we're asking the students to do. And so these have been really eliminated uh, from the 2025 syllabus. Uh, things like understand has been replaced with cognitive verbs like, um, for example, describe. Now both are categorized as retrieval and comprehension co uh, cognitive verbs, but it, you know, understand has the definition of uh, to perceive what is meant, but uh, to describe is to give an account in a written or an oral form. So it's a little bit more tangible, a little bit more concrete. So a few of those things have uh, occurred in terms of the cognitive verbs. The other big thing with the changes is the change to the objectives. Uh, currently in our 2019 syllabus, we've got seven objectives, uh, communication being the, the last one. Uh, in the new 2025 syllabus, that has been changed uh, and implement and embedded, pardon me, into the objective number one, uh, which is the describe ideas and findings. I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, um, but that that communicate objective has now been embedded into objective number one. And so it's now down to six objectives in total with the um, investigate phenomena as our last objective that we're going to be assessing students on. The last big change is to do with the subject matter. And I will speak a little bit more about the changes there, again, very concisely. Uh, but just to give you an idea of the changes that we're looking into or that we're going to be uh, working with in the 2025 syllabus. Um, so in terms of, in, in general, what's what's occurring in terms of the job, uh, subject matter, uh, The it's organised under three main headings. So science of understanding, uh, science inquiry skills, and the last one, which we're all familiar with, which is the science and human endeavour, uh, science and human endeavour. Uh, there's a new few things as well, which is the women in science, WIS, added to the science of human endeavour. And the other big thing that I'll be speaking a little bit about later on is the removal of the mandatory and suggested practicals. And that's been embedded into the science of human understanding um, 
uh, section as well of the subject matter. So in terms of the changes that is occurring, um, for those of you who have been uh, following up on the various versions of the syllabus as it's coming through the draft versions there is, you would have noticed that there were a lot of um, things that were implemented in the first few drafts. For example, HNMR was um, placed at the very beginning, as was the common iron effect. So these are all content that was initially included, but that didn't come through in the final uh, revised version, and that's the approved 2025. So there's a few shufflings um, that has occurred, and really that just to streamline. I think um, the message that we can take from this is that QCA has really heard teachers' concerns about the huge cognitive load that it was placing on students, especially for the Unit 3 and 4 content. And so we see a lot of the changes occurring um, being, yeah, impacting those units. Not so much in the Unit 1 and 2, but definitely there are definitely changes that we need to be mindful of. For example, um, in terms of the Topic 1, uh, for the atomic structure and atoms, um, all the things to do with the hydrogen series has been has been removed. Whereas in things to do with the ionization, successive ionization energies, that's been that's been moved as well. Um, for me, a really big difference is the removal, or oh, not really removal, but the movement of the measurement and uncertainty section. In the old textbook, if you're using the Oxford, it's a chapter 10. It's explicitly um, taught within our content, within our course. It's something that we allocate time for. That's no longer the case because that's actually been moved to the science inquiry. So that's something that's um, quite, quite different and we'll need to manage that as, as teachers and staff. Um, you'll see a few things as well. So um, the removal of um, HPLC and um, as well as... GC uh, they've, and chromatography, they've been moved, as well as the pH scale and the logarithmic scale as well. That's That's been removed and, and for clarification, I guess to show that there's a seamless transition into the Unit 3 acids and basic basis topic. Uh, we come through to Unit 3, and that's essentially where you're going to see a lot of the changes. So predominantly a lot of the modifications, a lot of things have been omitted from the Unit 3 uh, content. Um, for example, uh, in terms of you'll notice that in terms of the unit three, um, we've got, I, and this is probably a reflection of the IA2s. A lot of students actually are working on Faraday's constant and calculating the mass um, produced from electrolysis. So that's been introduced into the con um, content, as well as the solubility constants for equilibrium. So those are things that have been um, added. Uh, in terms of things that have been removed or they've been added, a lot has been around the organics. And like I said, it's really a reflection of QCA listening to the staff and teachers about the um, immense amount of content that's required to be covered in such a short amount of time. So there's a, a, a significant list there. Um, and, and for those of you, again, who have been following up with the QCA webinars, we'll, we'll realise that, number one, the organic reactions pathway is now going to be moving into the data formula book. So that will be an additional thing um, that will be new for the 2025. Substitution reactions for uh, using potassium cyanide for the production of nitriles is removed totally. Things to do with transesterification and biodiesel, I know that's been removed. Um, uh, the, the extent of knowing, for example, um, in terms of complex carbohydrates, that's been removed. So no longer uh, are we going to be teaching really in to the depth of uh, things like amylose, amylopectin, the, the variations between glyco, um, glycogen and so forth and starch, uh, all of that has been removed. Um, what has been moved, like I said, is the reaction pathway um, and there's a few things as well that's been clarified as well. Um, enzymes is another thing that's been removed. I've already mentioned about the transesterification. And in terms of the polypeptides, we're going to be adding polystyrene uh, there as well as being a specific content. Things that have been removed, and it's no surprise, are things like X-ray um, crystallography, uh, molecular manufacturing. So things that uh, 
originally weren't allocated a lot of time in the syllabus, but teachers really found, number one, that they weren't experts in the field and so weren't very familiar with teaching them to a really in-depth way um, and just ones that really uh, perhaps were a little disconnected um, a, a little bit to the other pieces of information that we were teaching in terms of topic two of organic uh, matter. I hope I'm not speaking too fast. So one of the biggest changes, I think, in terms of the syllabus, uh, besides the changes in terms of the subject matter, is the removal of mandatory and suggested practicals. So, you know, initially it would look like it would seem that that section has already been removed completely, but it hasn't. So it's just been integrated into the science inquiry section. And so that the explicit teaching of in mandatory prax is something that's going to be really focused on in the internal assessment and not so much in the external assessment. That's sort of the message that we're getting as staff and, and teachers. Um, so with that respect, I thought it would be really helpful to break up the um, the monotony of me speaking is for us to just interact and uh, I guess benefit from each other as staff and professionals in the field in conducting a little, a little activity to do with the IA2. Now, we all know that the IA2 is the student experiment. And we know as well that, um, sorry, that slide is just saying how no longer is that distinction between suggested and mand mandatory prac that's been removed. And now it's in the science inquiry. So you will notice in the new syllabus, there'll just be a list of, um, I guess, investigations that are, are recommended. And uh, how we do that internally is really up to the school. Uh, it's not really specified um, based on, you know, our own resources, our own circumstances, because it is a big state. So just narrowing our focus for the time being, if you'd permit me to look at the student experiment, the IA2. We know that we, much of us, prepare our students in year 11 in um preparing for the IA2, so running through what is really is required in order for them to meet the criteria in Year 12. Um, the new textbook actually has a list and a guide of all the practicals for Unit 1, uh, some of which we would have been familiar with and some that are new. There's, I think, three or four new experiments that uh, weren't in the 2019 syllabus that have appeared in the 2025. So I thought looking at the list, uh, just for a little activity, we can look to, say, modify if we were to choose an experiment and if we were to ask the students to modify, extend or uh, refine, um, and what would that look like for the students and to have a student's perspective? And I, and I thought, why not, uh, from the list of practicals, why not choose the separation of a mixture using paper or thin layer chromatography. I thought that was an unusual one. It's not one that I physically had, had done with um, my students in the past, uh, but it certainly is an interesting one to do and probably not a very hard experiment, pardon me, for us to in, uh, implement within our schools, school settings. So if we were to choose this, I guess, mandatory prac or simulation, and if we were to ask the students um, to use that to... Um, to refine, redirect or extend. I guess we'll need to first explain to the students is that, you know, what is wrong with the original experiment? What are the, what are the errors? What are the extraneous or compounding factors? Um, is there something that we can increase in terms of the scope uh, of the original experiment that they can use as a justified modification to come up with their final experiment? And so if that was the case and you were given putting on your student hat, if you were given that original experiment, and I'll just go back to uh, the separation of a mixture using paper or thin layer chromatography, I'd love to benefit from all of you and for all of us to benefit from each other. If you in the chat um, can, you know, pose what would be a suitable, and sorry, I've gone a little bit too fast. So, um, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, everyone is familiar with the original experiment. Uh, to refine means the original experiment is not accurate or precise, and so we're looking to refine it, whether it's to include equipment with a better degree of uncertainty uh, in terms of the measurement, 
um, to extend is to look at a an extension of a variable um, and to redirect is to look at a different variable altogether. So a certain natural factor that's affected the results in the original one, and that's the one that's going to be the focus of the new methodology for those um, of us who are new. Um, and so if we were to generate our own research question, uh, having our student uh, hats on, what would be uh, your research question? If your original experiment was to uh, separate an unknown mixture using thin layer chromatography. Uh, if you can put it in the chat, hopefully it will appear and we can um, benefit from each other. It may take a while. So if you just want to put, you know, looking at, for example, how the variation in polarity of the mobile phrase impacts um, separation of the mixture. There's one. Beautiful. Yep. Yep. So how does the polarity uh, affect the RF value? So that's a better... Uh, dependent, independent, solvent concentration, absolutely. So changing the concentration of the mobile phase is one. Um, how can the separation changes when you change the, yep, good. Polarity of the mobile phase, yep. Varying the solvent type. Yeah, length of the stationary phase is a good one. Yep. Thickness of the chromatography paper, yep. You could even assess the um, the distance between the outlets and when they're spotted on the thin layer, temperature, changes of the solvent, absolutely. So that would be a, a possible redirection from the original. The thickness of the chromatography paper certainly would also be a redirection. Polarity of the solid phase, yep, the coating of the solid phase. I'll just give you a few more minutes. We've got some great. Yep, so this definitely is a, a specific um, research question. So can thin layer chromatography be used to identify an unknown component of, say, a specific sample using ABC as known sources or standards, I guess, like drug testing for urine analysis, so liking it to something um, theoretically based. Yep. That's really good. Okay. Well, thank, thanks, guys. I think, yeah, I think that's um, most of you, your submissions. So we've got a, a few variations there. We've definitely got a few redirections and a few variables being uh, looked at that definitely deviate from the original mod um, experimental investigation. Uh, we didn't get a lot of refinement, so perhaps looking at refining um, the, I guess, the set volume in or the container in which the stationary phase is, occur is put in in terms of the mobile phase. Um, so there's a few refinements that we can do as well. Um, and then there's obviously a few extensions with looking at variation in concentration, looking at variation of polarity of the mobile phase. So uh, we've got a few things there that we can sort of get the kids to, to be thinking about when we're looking at an IA2. Um, so ones that um, I've come up with in terms of uh, for this experiment, so uh, for example, in terms of refinement, the research question could be, you know, can the food dyes present in lollies be effectively separated using paper chromatography? Um, in terms of an extension, we can look at does this separation of food dyes by paper chromatography vary with different mobile phases? And finally, in terms of redirection, uh, you can look at plant pigments. Can they be separated by paper chromatography to distinguish different species? 
So those are the ones that I sort of uh, came up with um, it's just in preparation for that. So in terms of understanding the IA2 instrument specific mark, marking guide, because we've just looked at uh, what it is that the students are required to do from a student perspective, we know that one of the things that uh, really challenge uh, students is um, the conclusion and evaluation, the analysis of the data and the evaluation. So uh, those skills are the ones that traditionally in terms of the Queensland cohort, they don't usually do very well right, in comparison to the old research and planning criteria. Um, and so in terms of the internal assessment, we know that's weighing uh, 20%. Uh, what I, I wanted to ask in general, if you can put down a chat. Sorry, I'm just going to reduce my slide there. Um, if you were to think about the changes that are going to be implemented for the 2025 syllabus around specifically the internal instruments, and even though the format of those instruments aren't changing, it's the um, the ISMG, the internal, uh, so the instrument specific marking guides, we know that they've been reformatted uh, in terms of no longer being called research and planning, analysis and evaluation and communication, and they've, uh, I guess, being shuffled around to make that best fit model application a little bit more equitable and a little bit easier across the state. I was interested, again, if you can, in the poll, just put down your ideas on what are the challenges that you see come out of these new changes? Um, what are the opportunities that you can see also that possibly can't come out of those opportunities? And I'll start you guys off by saying I know for me, um, because I am um, the head of chemistry, all the resources in terms wow. of the checklists for wow. um, the is student experiment, as well as the research investigation, that they've all got to be remade. So they've just got to be reshuffled with all the appropriate titles. And, and so something that's going to be a challenge is just ensuring that, you know, we have time to, to do that in time um but yeah what what do you guys think in regards to the changes that are occurring if you can put down your thoughts Anyone? No? Okay. So I, I know that one thing that I hadn't thought of is probably um, the opportunity of the fact that it makes the best fit application a lot more equitable. Um, I guess another challenge is that I didn't think about is that currently in our 2019 application of the student, um, the specific marking guide, if a kid gets one communication characteristic in at the one level, not the two level, they can still get away with a two out of two for communication. Whereas because that communication objective has been actually embedded into objective one or the first criterion, if they actually don't meet that characteristic, it will actually drop them an entire mark for that entire um, criterion. Um, one person has said that, uh, by making the criteria more generic, it is more difficult to specifically explain expectations in terms of the criteria. Another person said, I like the odd number of dot points in each criteria. I agree. So it definitely makes the application of the um, best fit model a little bit easier to apply. Um, So I think, I'm sorry for the person who put the comment, by making the criteria more generic, it's more difficult to specifically explain expectations. Are you saying that it makes it a little bit more am ambiguous? I'm not too sure. Are there any thoughts on the matter? Anyone else have anything to say with regards to what they can see coming out of this reshuffling of the marking guides? Okay. No, not really. All right. We're all happy. 
good. <laughs> so as I was saying before, traditionally as a Queensland co cohort, students really don't do well in um, the current uh, communicate, uh, sorry, conclusion evaluation and the analysis and interpretation criterion of the um, of the ISMG. So you can see here, and I'm not sure if it's clear on your screens, um, but for the analysis of evidence for the IA2, you know, just over 40% of students actually get the full marks. And for the interpretation and evaluation, uh, just under 30% of students get the full marks. Now, uh, in terms of the actual characteristics of those criterions, they actually haven't been reworded or changed. They've just been reshuffled and retitled. So, so that there is an odd number of characteristics per criterion. So if you look at the new ISMG, and if we're just focusing on the interpretation and, um, sorry, interpretation evaluation, so specifically looking at, for example, the justified discussion of the reliability and validity of experimental process. So if we're just looking at that characteristic for interpretation, um, we know that previously using QCA sources and QCA exemplars, we're really looking for um, students based on these exemplars. I don't know about you guys, and there is going to be the variation within us on what we're looking for in terms of exemplars to meet the five, six criteria or the top marking criteria. But traditionally, we're looking for an identification of a limitation or a source of error and um, some form of a reflection on how that impacts the ability to conclude, to make a conclusion. So, and, and specifically refer referencing the, uh, the impact it has on the accuracy of the data or in terms of the precision of the data. Um, so what I thought we would do, because I don't want to go uh, too much over time, I've prepared two, I guess, two student exemplars. Now, admittedly, they're both based on Unit 3 type experiments. The one on your left-hand side is uh, based on uh, a galvanic cell setup. So students who have just looked at variation in uh, metal reduction potentials and basically the E0 or the voltage produced. And the experiment on the right is a student experiment of uh, calculating or quantitating the amount of uh, ascorbic acid in um, orange juice or vitamin C are using a titration. So if this was a student exemplar and this just was one very tiny snippet and you were asked to make a, a comment on which sample is better and why, again, the only thing I want you to think of is the justified discussion of reliability and validity of the experimental process. So we're not looking at identification of limitations. We're not looking at improvements, suggested improvements. We're just looking at the two exemplars. Which one do you think is better at um, making a justified discussion of the reliability and validity of the experimental process given the two pieces of uh, graphs or the data set and the student response? If you guys can go ahead and and put your responses or your thoughts. There's no right or wrong. And we, we do look for different characteristics. Yeah, so... Sample one uses quantitative data to justify the R and V, whereas sample two only uses qualitative descriptions. Someone said sample one. Awesome. First one has referred to data for justification. Yep. Specific error values. So I think we're all consistent in looking for it for the same thing. So when we're looking for an IA2, um, specific error value, sample one, one for quantitative data. Yeah. It's great. 
So, yeah, so, so I'm I'm in agreement. I think I look for the same thing when I'm marking my student IA2s. I'm looking for data specifically um, that's used to link to the identified um, limitations or sources of error. So, yeah, that that's that's really good. It confirms that we're all on the right track. Pardon me. So thanks, guys, for your um, your corroboration today. It's been really great. I hope that you find the next session super exciting because um, this is where we've got some really exciting features in the textbook. And I'll hand over to Alina. Perfect. Thanks, Mariette. Let me introduce you to the second edition of Chemistry for Queensland Units 1 to 4. Um, the series is available in a few different configurations. Um, we have the print product, student and teacher digital access, and um, the value pack. Um, Mel will talk to you a bit about this later, but for now, I'll take you through the key features of the student books. Um, so as you've seen, our author team, including Marriott, has carefully analyzed the changes to the syllabus and has they've produced a fully revised resource to support your um, implementation of the new syllabus. Um, this includes complete syllabus coverage and removal of any extraneous content. Learning intentions and success criteria have been derived from the subject matter dot points and they've been clearly defined. So these have really driven the revision process. And we've been really conscious about um, using accessible language and chunking content to better support teaching and help guide um, students through learning the content. Each module is supported by a prior learning quiz. Um, these assess students on their existing learning and recommend resources to help them get up to speed if they need to brush up on any knowledge before jumping into the new content. The chemistry toolkit has also been expanded to improve, um, well, it's been expanded to uh, more comprehensively cover the science inquiry skills, as well as uh, provide you support for the internal and external assessments. Um, as Merit mentioned, the measurement uncertainty and error topic has been absorbed into the um, toolkit since it now sits with the science inquiry skills. So the toolkit's been resequenced to help support students through this and build their um, inquiry skills in a more logical and scaffolded manner. Um, of course, pracs are available to help you address all the analyzed cognitions in the science understanding, as well as the science inquiry requirements. And we're also providing um, short answers uh, with fully worked solutions available online. Um, unfortunately, we don't have the time to talk through all the features in a lot of detail. So I'm just going to highlight a few major things. Um, as I mentioned, the learning intentions and success criteria um, will be provided. So these are available to students and they're directly linked to um, online checklists that students can use to self-assess against the success criteria. The worked examples have been transformed to walk students through um, the thinking behind how to answer common questions and then shows them uh, what needs to be put down on the page via the do column. Each worked example also features a your turn component, and this invites students to apply what they've learned from the worked example um, to a brand new question. Uh, with the huge emphasis on skills, our expert authors have built in many opportunities to practice science inquiry skills throughout each lesson. So these come in the form of skill drills, which are embedded and um, relevant to the content that's being uh, learned at the time, as well as data drills, which appear in every module review. And these are essentially mini data tests for students. Uh, we've also transformed the science as a human endeavor spreads into real world chemistry features. These also sit in context within lessons. Um, so they're directly linked to the science understanding. And these come with more targeted questions. Um, all the surveys we've conducted have um, asked us for more questions and we've really tried to deliver on this. Not only do we have more questions, but we also now pr provide mark allocations for all of them to get your students exam ready. Um, an exciting new feature is the exam essentials. Uh, these sit within unit reviews and they start with an exam tip, which models uh, well, the exam tip and then um, that 
after that, um, students are provided with a um, either past exam question or a exam style question with um, high and low scoring responses modeled. Um, these responses are annotated with um, where students have gained or lost marks, depending on whether they have or haven't applied that exam tip. Uh, once students have reviewed that, they're invited to think like an examiner. So um, this allows them to apply their subject matter knowledge in combination with their understanding of that exam tip in order to mark a response. And um, a marking guide is also provided for them to do this. Um, assessment success is also supported with some online resources, including practice exams, mock data tests, and samples for both IA2 and 3. Uh, now to have a look at digital. Um, I'm excited to announce that we've completely reimagined Oxford Digital. So if you're currently using Oxford, it will be a brand new experience. If you're not an Oxford user, it will be a brand new experience. Um, this new platform will support learning in new ways and offer lots of exciting um, tools and functionality to support um, a more personalized learning experience for your students and also make your lives easier. Um, content is fully accessible with questions and activities integrated into each lesson. Um, we've also done all the hard work to help you save time with um, online lesson plans, the live lesson mode, which um, I'll show you later, and enhanced reporting functionality. Uh, we'll look at these in a video in a moment. Uh, we also have three major partnerships. So Quizlet replaces the old flashcard glossary. Uh, we're also working with Learnosity to author a wide range of um, interactive questions, including um, auto-marked and teacher-marked questions. Um, results from these questions uh, feed into curriculum reports, so you can easily monitor um, your students' performance. And we've also partnered with uh, ClickView to bring you a selection of um, syllabus-aligned videos, which can be S access directly from Oxford Digital. Those who have not seen the study guides will still be valid. So they're valid this year and valid next year, and then we'll reissue them again. There's a code on the inside of them that which will give you access to all the previous exams. And there's an exam at the back of it. If you have not seen a study guide or you don't know about it, please contact me. I'm happy to send a couple of um, complimentary to the school. So they're great. The students can uh, buy them themselves and they don't have to pay shipping if they put a special code in. That's all online. Um, please stay online and share your feedback, but we're here to help. The other thing I wanted to mention is a lot of schools nowadays will work with a third party platform, which is like Recloud, Box of Books or Campion, My Connect. We work with them as well. You just need to be mindful that everything that you was shown on digital, the students will be given access through these third parties. The teachers are given access, but for you to assign work, manage reports um, and do all that, you need an online class set up. Um, at Campion and Box of Books do not set up online classes. Um, you'd have to contact ReCloud. I think they do at the moment, but that's where Chris and I come into it. We will help set up your online class. We can train you on how to manage your online class. It's very easy. We can help you navigate the um, platform. There's always a help tab on there to help you as well. So that's what we're here for. Great, thanks, I think Mel. That's about it. So if you just drop down our details. Thanks, Mel. Um, yep, as Mel said. Um, reach out um, if you have any questions. Um, with that, I see that we have some questions in the Q&A that have come through. So I'm just going to read through them and direct them wherever um, to whoever's best place to answer them. Um, so we've got one from Belinda. Are the, are the videos hosted on YouTube? Some schools have videos uh, YouTube blocked. Yes. So um, the videos that are hosted on the Oxford Digital uh, will be a mix of our own bespoke videos, which will be Vimeo and also ClickView videos. Um, so we shouldn't have a problem with YouTube. Um, in terms of embedded AI in the extended response questions, um, at the moment, no. Um, but uh, I'd say watch this space. <laughs> Um, in terms of drawing structures, um, I suppose this is a question about the, um, the questions that students can work on online. Um, the advantage of using Learnosity is they have a broad range of uh, question types, including drawing uh, tools. So um, where relevant, we definitely uh, want to use those. And so short answer to your question is yes. Um, 
how well do the online questions on quizzes integrate with Canvas? Um, in terms of that, my understanding is that um, uh, uh, to avoid saying something not quite right, um, I might just um, hold on to that for now and I can um, reach out to you with a proper answer once I confirm. Um, and then we've got, since we are getting version 1.1 sometime later in term three, are you holding off and finalizing the resource to ensure it fully aligns? This is a good question. Um, um, at the moment, we're set for um, publishing as per the dates um, that we presented earlier. Um, but of course, we want to make sure that we're um, capturing any of um, these clarifications made by QCAA. So where possible, we'll try to integrate them in. With that then, uh, I might just say thank you for your attendance today. Um, I hope you have a really good remainder of your day. Please hang back and complete the feedback form. It, it will pop up once uh, this webinar concludes. So um, thanks again.